Do you remember the good old days when all you had to worry about was getting your homework done and getting home before curfew? Before you had to worry about jobs, projects, working, when you could long for a summer vacation and a winter break? Well, this is the podcast for when you realize that life can be hard. Hold on one moment. Ah, <sighs> finally he's gone. Last thing I need to hear is him plugging another podcast. Come take a listen to my show, Adulting Ain't Easy, every other Wednesday on the Journey into Comics Network. The following is a following journey into comics. 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 Network. 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 Production. Production. You're listening to Poor Entertainment with your host. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Andrew Poor. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. This is Poor Entertainment, the show about things that are entertaining to you and to everyone else. And if they're not, you always just stay tuned because this thing does jump around a little bit. And if you want some more political news, because it is Election Day 2018, so be, go out there and vote. If you're listening to this on your way to work, check it out. Go vote on your way home. Check out your polling places if you're registered. If not... It's definitely too late, so better luck next time. Definitely, if you're Democrat or Republican, check out, go out and vote. But this is Porn Entertainment, so let's get rid of all that news crap that we have to talk, that we have to worry about on the other show, and just focus on this. This is episode seven, which happens to be my lucky number, so hopefully this will be a good episode for you as it is for me. Now, what I want to get to this week is pretty straightforward. There was not a ton of news this past couple weeks since our last episode, so I kind of want to break in because we are at the middle point. We are at week 9 of the 2018 NFL season. We just finished that last night. That was week 9, so we're definitely getting at that about that middle point. So we've got to see what's going to happen the rest of the 2018 season. But jumping in, this is an article from the USA Today, and this is 32 things we learned from week 9 of the 2018 LFL season. So if you're a football fan, definitely stay tuned for this. There's some stuff going on. So... Spoiler alert, the Saints will rise one spot to number one in our next installment of Power Rankings after spoiling the Rams' bid for perfection. So yeah, the Saints are going to rise to the number one spot. Also, uh, this is number two. We're no big fans of lifetime achievement and fluid individual awards in, my, in any season, but it sure would be nice to see Drew Brees finally win League MVP honors. Sorry, that's the cat of my existence. I'm in my office, which all happens to be where the cat food and all that stuff is. So if you hear the meowing in the background, that is why. Um, and he's definitely deserving at this point. His 76.3 completion percentage is well ahead of record pace. And his 120.6 passer rating is just a touch off the single season mark held by Aaron Rodgers of 122.5. If Saints wide receiver Michael Thomas, the league's most underrated player, maybe not, after putting up a franchise record 211 receiving yards on CB Marcus Peters, Mostly, and the Rams, and maybe uh, not now that Thomas has taken a page from the Joe Horn self-promotion manual. At number four, are the Texans the most underrated team in the league? They'll lead the entire AFC South by two and a half games if Tennessee fails to Dallas on Monday night. I'm recording this before the game is over, so I can't really comment on how the Titans uh, Titans Cowboys game goes, but I will. Definitely have to see how that shakes out. And yes, they're the same Texans who lost their first three, but have now matched the 1970 Giants as the only squad in the Super Bowl year to start 0-3 before reeling off six consecutive victories. So, woo! Is Phillip Rivers the most underrated player in the NFL history? Nice to see him lead the Chargers 6-2 to the biggest win of the season of the day. He became the fourth quarterback to start 200 consecutive games behind Brett Favre, Eli Manning, and Peyton Manning. So, good for him. By the way, if you haven't paid attention, the Bolts are tied for the league's fifth best record. Circle December 13th. It's a Thursday. You're free for the rematch with the Chiefs in Kansas City. Okay. Uh, But uh, one memo to the Chargers. You might have kept the wrong kicker. Caleb Sturgis has returned from a quad injury and missed two PATs. Oops, sorry. It's kind of scrolling away from here. Missed two PATs and a 42-yard field goal. Opening Mike Batchley, who was perfect on 10 kicks in his two-game audition, remains on speed dial. Uh, 5C uh, update. The Chargers got the memo Monday morning and parted with Sturgis. So they did uh, drop him this morning. Or yesterday morning. Um, number six. Shame the Chargers' latest uh, win came at the Seahawks' expense as they honored late owner Paul Allen at CenturyLink Field for the first time since his death on October 15th. 
I talked about Paul Allen on the last episode of Pornertainment, I believe. Paul Allen, as you know, was one of the founders of Microsoft along with Bill Gates. So we're sorry to see that. Uh, Julio Jones uh, scored uh, our Overload National Nightmares over after the Falcon star found the end zone for the first time since January 6th when he, Atlanta beat the Rams in the wild card round. Oh my gosh, hold on one second. Come in. Everyone, that is my very vocal cat who just doesn't like to be kept out of any room. So now he's up on the desk eating. So, always fun for that. So, uh, number eight. The Eagles spent the weekend on the couch. That's where NFL players while away their bites, right? Yet pulled within a game of the NFC East leading Redskins who were trounced by Atlanta 38-14. What is it about Gillette Stadium? Remember when Kareem Hunt fumbled his first NFL carry there in 2017 and never losing one at Toledo? At least his Chiefs came back to beat the Patriots. Uh, Packers running back Aaron Jones lost his first fumble after 150 turnover free touches Sunday night. Which, previously, which proved disastrous in the Green Bay's loss. You all know this Battle of the Goats thing is really dumb, right? By definition, only one goat, meaning greatest of all time, that said, we'd certainly prefer not to wait until 2022 for Aaron Rodgers versus Tom Brady uh, 3. Uh, if TB12 can last that long, but we'll need a pack, Pat, Super Bowl in the interim to make it happen. Uh, 10A, speaking of goats, neither Von Miller nor J.J. Watt qualify either. Firm up film of Lawrence Taylor and Reggie White, if you disagree. Still, pretty cool to see this generation's top sack artist and 2011 draft mate shared the same field while each added a quarterback takedown to his career total. Prior to kick off at M&T Bank Stadium, the Ravens honored victims of Pittsburgh Synagogue Massacre with a moment of silence. It was another sign of the respect in the Baltimore Steelers rivalry, which is hotly contested by rarely nasty a la Army-Navy. Number 12, Ben Roethlisberger isn't afraid to quick kick on the fourth down. Sunday's first quarter pooch was the seventh punt, including one that was blocked in 2014 of his 15-year career. Those average gross uh, dipped to 31.3. It was the first time any quarterback had punted since Brady in 2013. In a mini-twist, Raven uh, Raven Eric Weddle returned Big Ben's duck for 18 yards, the first time he'd handled a punt since 2012. Are the Lamar Jackson packages really doing the spiraling Ravens any good? He was constantly bouncing from field to the sideline Sunday, ultimately contributing one 12-yard completion while averaging a meager two yards on five carries. Where starter Joe Flacco was struggling to find a groove amid what seems like disruption. Embattled coach John Harburg envisioned something like the Saints have employed with Breeze and Taysom Hill, but might be better off picking the Flacco lane or Jackson lane. 14, man, that 2017 Pittsburgh draft class backup quarterback Joshua Dobbs completed his first career pass for 22 yards while Roethlisberger was temporarily sidelined after getting the win knocked out of him. Oh, and uh, 14A. Oh, and second-year Steelers running back James Conner churned out more than 100 yards in the fourth straight game, all victories, and caught his first NFL touchdown pass. Sure seems like Ravens defensive coordinator Wink Martindale was on to something when he insinuated last week that Pittsburgh might be better without Le'Veon Bell. Even though running back Alan Collins was dealing with a foot injury, Baltimore's Ty Montgomery was inactive after being acquired from Green Bay at Tuesday's trade deadline. Montgomery aside, none of the prominent players traded Tuesday made major impacts while debuting for their new clubs. Golden Tate's uh, Golden Eagles were off. Ha Ha Clinton Dix had a team-high seven tackles for Washington, but also got trucked by fellow Crimson Tide alum Julio Jones on his 35-yard touchdown. Dante Fowler had just one stop. It was a TFL for the Rams. Uh, 15B, oh, these... Of those dealt at the deadline, only Texans wide receiver Demarius Thomas experienced a win. He got three passes for 61 yards at Houston, as Houston beat Thomas's former team Denver 19-17. He battled Broncos rookie replacement Cortland Sutton, three catches 57 yards to a draw. All right, good for him. 16, Vikings wide receiver Adam Thielen managed just four catches for 22 yards, meaning he failed to become the first player to notch nine consecutive 100-yard receiving games. So close. And and uh, 68, and given Stephon Tiggs was out with a rib injury, additional fodder for those who suggest Thielen is effective Minnesota's number two receiver and has been racking up numbering by feasting on single coverage. But don't do it, we're still going to streak the NFL. We're still going to streaking in the NFL. Chiefs quarterback Patrick Mahomes 
match Andrew Luck's 2014 record by passing for at least 300 yards in eight consecutive games during the same season. Mahomes wasn't done. His 29, yard, his 29 touchdown passes and 3,185 passing yards are the most ever in a player's first 10 NFL games. His MVP case remains rock solid with 2,901 yards and 29 touchdown strikes this season, topping leaderboards. Number 18, former Texas Tech quarterback Mahomes is greater than former Texas Tech quarterback Baker Mayfield. Before some of you at me, no, that's not a typo. Mayfield spent his freshman year in Lubbock before transferring to Oklahoma. Okay. Uh, Greg Williams is Cleveland's 10th head coach, including those of the interim variety since the Browns returned to the NFL in 1999. He and his predecessors are combined 0-10 in their respective debuts following Sunday's 37-21 loss to Kansas City. Your new NFL sack leader, this is 20. Meet Dan- Danielle Hunter? Dan, well, looks like Danielle, but it's, guy, it's pretty sure it's a guy. Who's a three and a half of the Vikings team records, 10 in Sunday's win against Detroit. We tell me it's just the Minnesota defense is back. Buffalo should strongly consider calling erstwhile Cardinals quarterback Sam Bradford. Bradford should strongly consider screening calls with a 716 area code emanating from western New York. Much maligned Bills quarterback Nathan Peterman, now his six career touchdown passes, three to teammates, and three to opponents. One more stat to add to the list my new room, my new teammate, Jory Epstein, put together after 130 career throws. Peterman's passer rating is 32.5. By comparison, throwing one in completion gets you to 39.6. George Kittle is making a belling case to be the first team all pro tight end despite all the injuries suffered by San Francisco's offense. Kansas City's Travis Casey reclaimed the inside track Sunday with two more touchdown catches, but Kittle is on his bumper. I've been tough on Case Keenum, be, but feel compelled to point out he keyholed a beautiful touchdown to tight end Jeff Huerman through triple coverage. Okay, maybe Keenum has no business targeting Jeff Huerman, of all people, in triple coverage. But Keenum also has had Denver in position to win before a missed field goal cost them the game. Most important, he failed to throw an interception for the first time as a Broncos progress. Or the first time as a Bronco progress, being him. Uh, number 25, Carolina's Curtis Samuel arguably had the touchdown of the weekend, 33-yard double reversing, covering nearly 104 actual yards per next-gen stats. 26, but how about some love for the Panthers running back Christian McCaffrey, who led his team with 79 yards rushing and 78 receiving. The explosive second-year player tend to get lost among the hubbub surrounding Todd Gurley, Alvin Kamara, Ezekiel Elliott, Saquon Barkley, and even Hunt. Among the next wave of elite runners, but McCaffrey's 80 yards from scrimmage have him in ninth place tie among league leaders. It wasn't the 1982 AFC Championship game, thanks Don Shula, but Jets fans were having flashbacks Sunday morning when they heard Miami's field was unplayable. Turned out to be exaggerated, but then rookie Sam Darnold had a Richard Todd kind of day with four interceptions in New York's 13-6 loss. If you saw the Nick Mullins train coming, you're lying. The 49ers undrafted third-string quarterback entering this season, if you consider the practice squad as third string, should soon be atop the depth chart after throwing for 260 yards and three touchdowns in his debut Thursday. His 151.9 pass rating was the second best ever after Marcus Mariota in 2015 for a quarterback in his first NFL game. Good on him, Nick Mullins. <clears throat> if you predicted John Gruden's Raiders would be a 1-7 at the halfway mark and Khalil Mack, Amari Cooper, and Bruce Irwin would be ex-Raiders, you're pathological. Uh, Cord Durrell Peterson has been an all-pro returner in his career, though a disappointed as a receiver. No matter how, he's now imbued with the Patriot way and has been New England's leading rusher twice in six days. Um, 31, hashtag TB1K update. Neil Downs are a bummer. Brady came within one yard of fulfilling his 19-year pursuit for 1,000 career rushing yards. Sunday night, alas, he took a knee three times to ice the Packers, ultimately costing him three yards. The train was in full reverse before stopping at 996. Winning is the worst. I'm not the biggest Brady fan, but that's a whole other thing. Number 32, why would schedule makers give both Indianapolis and Jacksonville the same bye week? What kind of world are we living in where neither Bortles nor Captain Andrew Luck is obligated to entertain us on Sunday? And I guess that is the 32 things. And while we stick with football, this is a Washington Post article. At the NFL's midpoint, there are these four teams, and then there's everybody else. By the time Patrick Mahomes had dropped another 375 passing yards, Michael Thomas had opened a second cellular plan, and Tom Brady had outlasted Aaron Rodgers. Sunday reinforced the unusual clarity at the top of the NFL. Most years halfway through the season is when we can start the process of returning the best teams in the league. When the pictures just begin to come into focus, this year after Week 9, the answers arrived in vivid color. Championship Sunday is two and a half months away, but four teams have already defined themselves as obvious favorites to make it there. 
A quartet has risen to the top of the NFL, and it just happens to nearly fit into a pair of potential conference title games. In the AFC, the New England Patriots have won six consecutive games behind their future Hall of Fame quarterback, including a victory over the otherwise unbeaten and spectacular Kansas City Chiefs. In the NFC, the New Orleans Saints have won seven consecutive games behind their future Hall of Fame quarterback, including a victory over the otherwise unbeaten and spectacular LA Rams. Sunday, the Rams, Saints, Chiefs, and Patriots became further ingrained as both the NFL's best teams and favored participants in the conference title games. The Chiefs minced the Cleveland Browns 37-21, scoring at least 30 points for the eighth time in, in, in nine games. The Saints beat the Rams 45-35, but not before the Rams shut off their firepower in temporarily erasing a 21-point deficit, playing without star tight end Rob Gronkowski and first-round pick Sony Mitchell. The Patriots out class the Packers 31 to 17. There is a class of the league, but it would be crazy to write anything in pen. This the NFL surprises happened last season. Everyone held the Patriots and Steelers ticketed for the AFC championship for months. And then the Jaguars showed up. A group of teams this season could challenge the apparent supremacy of the Pats, Chiefs, Rams, and Saints. But if any other 28 teams made an appearance of this season's penultimate weekend, barring a serious injury, it would become as an upset. It's rare that can be said be so definitely at this stage of the season. Those four contenders have arrived here in different ways. The Chiefs turned into a monster by placing first-year starter Mahomes, an athletic marvel with bazooka attached to his right shoulder at the center of Coach Andy Reid's innovative, creative, offensive machine. The Saints have been on a mission since their gut-wrenching exit from the playoffs last January. They dealt a first-round pick to move up in the draft for pass rusher Marcus Davenport, Drew Brees, an MVP candidate, but the Saints are unstoppable because of their offensive line malls opponents, and Thomas and Alvin Kamara are two of the best, most consistent playmakers in the NFL. The Patriots rebounded from horrendous losses to the Jaguars and Lions, while Coach Bill Belichick tinkered and tweaked in New England like he always does. The moves included turning return special and disappointing wide receiver Cordell Patterson into a thumper of a running back. The Rams splurged um, in the offseason to take advantage of one uh, of the one of quarterback Jared Goff's final rookie contract years, creating a team with unmatched star power under the helm of Boyd genius coach Sean McVay. They had a pass rusher Dante Fowler at the trade deadline, but their defense remains a question. The Rams have allowed 26.7 points per game the past seven weeks that had not lost before the Saints knocked them off Sunday, but the loss had been weeks in the making. Those four teams separated themselves. What teams could challenge them in January? In the NFC, the obvious yet overlooked answer is the 6-2 Carolina Panthers. Cam Newton is playing as well as any quarterback in the league, completing a high percentage of his passes than any point prior in his career. Carolina is also best positioned to steal a bye. The Panthers play the Saints twice in the final three weeks of the season. In the AFC, the Steelers have overcome the absence of Le'Veon Bell by handling by handing the ball to second-year workhorse James Conner. Behind a punishing offensive line under fire early this year, coach Mike Tomlin had offered a reminder that he has a Super Bowl to his name and the second-highest winning percentage among active coaches with at least 30 games coached. The Texans, now 6-3 after a 0-3 start, have taken control of the AFC South. The 6-2 Chargers were hard to take seriously until Sunday when they handed, handled the surging Seahawks in Seattle. Their only two losses came against the Chiefs and Rams. Until their victory in Seattle, they had only beaten dregs. They maintained contact with Kansas City in the AFC West, and their past rush will be scary once Joey Bosa returns, possibly next week. Also scary in a different way in the kicking game, four kickers have combined to miss an extra of 22 extra points. Caleb's whiffed on two Sunday and was released on Monday. There's a sleeper that might crash into the championship Sunday, it's a team that could follow Jaguars' model from last year's playoffs. The Chicago Bears have a young, dominant defense of several blowout victories and an inconsistent quarterback with an odd knack for making crucial plays and randomly producing excellent performances. It's hard to see Mitchell Trubisky playing for a trip to the Super Bowl, but last, just last January we watched Blake Bortles do it. For now, though, Week 9 reaffirmed what the rest of the season already told us. The Patriots, Chiefs, Saints, and Rams are in one class and the rest of the league can be sorted out behind them. There's still another half of the regular season left, but it's hard to see that changing. And that really does it for NFL news for this week. Definitely stay tuned. I will be keeping this intermixed in my poor entertainment coverage over the next eight or nine weeks. It'll probably get truncated once I'm away for wedding stuff, but we'll see kind of how the rest of that shakes out. And moving from football and sports to movies, which is the last... Actually, though, before I get to movies, since movies will be a lot of the topics, one last little thing for people who really care. It's the only music news that I think was really worth talking about. 
And that is from a Rolling Stone article, and that is the Spice Girls are reuniting without Posh for a 2019 UK tour. Ginger Sporty, Baby, and Scary Spice bring girl power back to the six-date stadium track. I expected the Spice would reunite without Posh Spice for a 2019 UK stadium tour. The Spice Girls, Ginger Spice, Baby Spice, Sporty Spice, and Scary Spice officially announced their six-date track with a video posted on social media Monday. Singer Jess Glynn will serve as a special guest on the Now Quartet's tour, which kicks off June 1st, 2019 at Manchester's uh, Etihad Stadium? Etihad? And included with a gig at London's Wembley Stadium on June 15th. In September, Melanie Scary Spice Brown confirmed to James Corden that the Spice Girls would bring girl power back for a union tour that likely won't include Victoria Posh Spice Beckham. We're going to be going on tour, Brown told Corden. Us for sure. We'll see you about Posh, but... Us four are definitely going to be on tour. She might join us for a few shows. She better. We'll see what happens. However, Beckham denied her own involvement in the interview with Fogue. I'm not going on tour. Beckham said, what does that look like in the future? It's not me in a cat suit. In February, all five members of the Spice School released a statement where they talked about some exciting possibilities that will once again embrace the original essence of the Spice Girls. We are always overwhelmed how much interest there is across the whole world for the Spice Girls. The group said in a statement, this time now feels right to explore some incredible new opportunities together. There are five dates for those interested in those in the UK area, because I doubt anyone in the States, unless you're a big, big fan of the Spice Girls, are going to travel, and that is June 1st at Manchester, UK at Etihad Stadium, or Etihad, I don't know. June 3rd at Coventry, UK at Ryko Stadium. June 6th in Sunderland, UK at Stadium of Light. June 8th at Edinburgh, UK at BT Murrayfield Stadium. June 10th in Bristol, UK at Ashton Gate Stadium, and June 15th in London at Wembley Stadium. And that does it for the music news for this week. I'll hopefully have more exciting news for those listeners next time. Now, moving into movie news, one of the kind of hits me where it hurts, and that is that AMC is to raise the Stubbs A-list subscription price in select states. The circuit in 2019 will raise pricing for its ticket app, where it has proven most popular. As it continues to add subscribers to AMC Theater's Stubbs A-list cinema app is also set to hike its monthly rate in 16 U.S. states. AMC, the country's largest circuit, on Monday said it would hold the line on A-list subscribers to Stubbs pricing at $19.95 per month, plus taxes in 35 states in 2019. But the U.S. circuit will hike monthly service prices in states where the program is most popular. So Stubbs A-list consumers in California, Connecticut, Massachusetts, New Jersey, and New York will see their subscription price to see up to three movies a week in any format, including IMAX rise from $19.95 to $23.95 a month starting on January 9th, 2019. On average, the upcharge for an IMAX ticket is Four to five dollars, and in key markets like Los Angeles or New York, an IMAX ticket can cost upwards of twenty-one. And the monthly price of the AMC stub list will move to twenty-one ninety-five subscribers, also from nineteen ninety-five a month in Colorado, Delaware, Florida, Georgia, Illinois, Maryland, Minnesota, Pennsylvania, Virginia, Washington State, and the District of Columbia, effective January 9th, twenty nineteen. So, as a resident of the state of Illinois, I will be forced to pay that two dollar additional surcharge or two dollar price increase. Which still, when you really think about it, it's not worth canceling over. It's not like what happened with Movie Pass, where they try to raise price and add the surcharge and all that. This seems it'll be a little less invasive and should be a little better off. The differential pricing from next year's follows AMC's movie ticket subscription service, announcing it will reach 500,000 customers next week. Subs earlier forecast it would get to 500,000 subscribers by the end of June 2019 and 1 million by the end of June 2020. Our decision to keep the AMC stub day list monthly price unchanged 35 states, along with the only a modest price adjustment in some key markets going in place in early 2019, will keep us in that sweet spot of successfully balancing profits and popularity, AMC CEO President Adam Aaron said in a statement. The A-list stub service is rival to MoviePatch, which has seen its fortunes fall dramatically. AMC's subscription program will also follow another rival cinema script service, Cinemark's Movie Club, in allowing reserved seating in addition to online concession ordering. Aaron added the price hike for A-list stubs in certain states can be avoided, at least for 2019, if new subscribers act before the end of the year. The pricing program might will remain at the level for everyone who will be and will be unchanged anywhere for the full 12 months after initial enrollment if movers act now. So if you're in those states, definitely sign up before 2019. Pay the full year, and then you'll be stuck. You'll be nice set in that sweet spot of 995 for 12 months. It's still a nice chunk of change. But if you're in one of those states where it goes up two bucks, it's not that big a deal to have to pay two extra bucks a month when the alternative is paying ten ish twelve dollars a movie, especially for those IMAX or um, those other big screen type productions. 
So definitely do that. And moving on to movies that have come out or movies that are coming out. And that involves a movie that has no business being released in November. I don't get why they release Christmas movies in early November. And that is why Disney's Nutcracker failed to get a Christmas miracle. The Nutcracker in the Four Realms is likely to become a box office disaster or at least a minor financial whiff. The poorly reviewed Christmas story earned just $20 million in North America this weekend while earning $38 million overseas and 72% of its eventual overseas footprint. That includes a soft $12 million in China. So a spitball math alert, and the film earns around $55 million of what amounts to a 100% overseas debut and a $75 million worldwide opening. The film will need a whopping 4.3 times global multiplier to snag a $325 million worldwide uh, cum or around 2.5 times of its a 30 million budget. That's not impossible, but it's unlikely. More likely outcome is a three times multiplier and a 225 million worldwide cum. Uh, while the Mouse House will survive its this ambitious miss, the film's chief culprit is its budgets. Whether the director swap with Joe Johnson taking over for Last Halstrom, or the reshoots are to blame, 130 million is way too much to spend on a Christmas movie. Being that much on a Nutcracker movie flies in the face of three known variables. First, while the Nutcracker may be popular or well-known ballet, does never respond to hit movie. Just the Four Realms' 20 million debut makes it 9.43 times bigger than the next biggest Nutcracker movie, sans inflation. Like Pan or King Arthur, the Nutcracker is an IP where awareness doesn't mean interest in a souped-up and more fantastical filmed version. Second, most beloved Christmas classes were cheap enough not to make, not to require global box office domination in order to break even or make money. Home Alone was an 18 million budgeted comedy, so it's 285 million domestic and 476 million worldwide take. The biggest Christmas flick ever on both fronts, or pure profit after Thanksgiving weekend in 1990. Elf cost 33 million and earned 220 million worldwide in 2003, while all three of Tim Allen's Santa Claus movies combined, cost a combined 100 million, making its combined 473.5 million worldwide cum a huge win for Walt Disney. Due to the likes of National Lampoon's Vacation, 73 million domestic on a 25 million budget in 1989, and Nightmare Before Christmas, 75 million domestic on an 18 million budget in 1993. I'm really surprised that Nightmare Before Christmas only cost 18 had an 18 million dollar budget when a lot of it was that stop claymation, plus Hans Zimmer and all that. That's really surprising. There are some exceptions. Fred cost cost an absurd 100 million, so it's otherwise halfway decent. 97 million worldwide cum in 2006 qualified as a miss. Four Christmases cost $80 million in 2008, so that Reese Witherspoon, Vince Vaughn, rom-com family, comedies, $163 million worldwide. Cume was just not good enough. But in terms of an uber-expensive Christmas flick, Nutcracker in the Four Realms falls below only A Christmas Carol, which was $200 million in 2009, and The Polar Express, which was $165 million in 2004. Neither of those Robert Zemeckis mo-cap gems were profitable. They had $325 million and $310 million worldwide, respectively. So... Yeah, even DreamWorks animation holiday-themed animated adventure Rise of the Guardians featuring Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny as glorified superheroes earned just $306 million on a $165 million budget in late 2012. The only Christmas movie where big budgets equaled big profits was Ron Howard's How the Grinch Stole Christmas starring Jim Carrey in his prime, which earned a colossal $260 million domestic and $305 million worldwide on a $123 million budget in late 2000. Oh right, that's the other big variable. While there are exceptions, Rise of the Guardians, A Christmas Carol, Home Alone, Two Lost in New York, and Jingle All the Way, to name a few, most Christmas movies earn most of their money in North America. So with the caveat that it's presumably cost under $100 million, don't be shocked if Illumination's Dr. Seuss The Grinch scores a domestic overseas split closer to Hop, 5842, then Despicable Me 3, 2674. Spending as much as Disney did on the Nutcracker in the Four Realms goes against the grain of what Christmas movies do well and how they make their money. It was a very expensive movie based on a relatively untested IP and failed to appeal to those uninterested in a Disney live-action fairy tale that happened to be based around the Nutcracker. It was that so much that it had to be one of the very biggest Christmas movies ever, and they picked a sub-genre with a history of making more of its money in North America than overseas. By our Christmas miracle, the movie was always a long shot. Since this is going to afford a swing and miss here and there, it might as well try to buck the odds now and then. If Nutcracker had been a hit, that would have been noteworthy and a huge boom to the notion that Disney as a brand was strong enough to sell any live-action fairy tale, but it wasn't, and it continues Disney's interest streak of essentially having the biggest hits and the biggest bombs of the year. With Bohemian Rhapsody and A Star Is Born Kicking Butt and Mary Poppins Return on on tap for Christmas, maybe Nutcracker in the Four Realms really just needed some songs to go with its brief ballet sequences. So, yeah, there's that. And speaking of Bohemian Rhapsody... 
The Bohemian Rhapsody, this is an Indie Wire article, Bohemian Rhapsody called out for factual inaccuracies including cruel handling of Freddie Mercury's HIV diagnosis. Brian Singer's Freddie Mercury biopic did a big business at the box office, not the box office, sorry, but didn't believe everything you see in the movie. Bohemian Rhapsody overcame some disastrous reviews to conquer the box office with an impressive 50 million opening, but moviegoers shouldn't believe everything they see in Brian Singer's Freddie Mercury biopic. The script, written by Anthony McCartan with an approval from Queen band members Brian May and Roger Taylor, is being called out by film critics and writers for twisting Queen's actual timeline to great convenient drama for the movie. The numerous factual inaccuracies in Bohemian Rhapsody have been broken down in fact checks published on The Rap and Screen Crush, but two historical errors in the film stand out most for being egregious. One is the fact that Singer's movie makes Mercury seem like a villain for cashing in and wanting to make a solo album. Rami Malek's Mercury is seduced by his manager Paul Prenter, played by Alan Leach, to go off on his own. The tension between Mercury and his bandmates instantly occur where he breaks the news. In reality, Mercury wasn't even the first Queen member to make a solo album. Okay. Drummer Roger Taylor released solo albums Fun in Space and Stranger Frontier in 1981 and 1984, respectively both of which came out before Mercury's first solo effort, Mr. Bad Guy, in 1985. The movie leads viewers to believe it was Mercury who wanted to go solo and cause friction among the band, although Taylor had already made the same move twice. Taylor is played by Ben Hardy in the film, and it made it is made to appear as Mercury's biggest adversary in the group. When Mercury announces solo plans, Taylor scoffs the idea, which is ironic given what went down in real life. The second major faction actually is the handling of Mercury's HIV diagnosis. In the film, Mercury learns he is sick shortly before the band reunites for Live Aid. The script is Mercury uses diagnosis to cement the band's reformation, but in reality, Mercury like, most likely did not even know he had the disease before Live Aid. Queen's Live Aid performance took place in 1985, and all, all accounts Mercury wasn't diagnosed with HIV until April of 1987. The movie's altering of history has been criticized by the press. Never seen a film distort its facts in such a punitive way. It's like the movie wants to punish Freddie Mercury, wrote Up Rocks' Mike Ryan. Mercury's tragic death from AIDS was a defining moment in the early 90s fight for AIDS awareness. The now retcon his illness into his Live Aid performances seems flippant and cruel. In a piece entitled Bohemian Rhapsody is an Insult to Freddie Mercury, Daily Beast writer Kevin Fallon says the film's handling of Mercury's HIV diagnosis is a cruel, manipulative version of tragedy porn that is inaccurate and perpetuates the tropes of AIDS as punishment for gay promiscuity. It's inexplicable and perverse that the movie retcons Mercury's HIV diagnosis as the band's motivation for Live Aid. IndieWire's own David Elrich added in his review, It's insulting to see the links in which the film tries to capture the melodrama of Queen's music, and humiliating to see the links by which it fails. So, I'm still hit or miss on actually wanting to see this movie. I do like Queen's music, Bohemian Rhapsody being one that every person knows the lyrics to, and every drunk person at a party will at some point sing in a big handling. And I'm pretty sure I did that at my high school reunion just a few weeks back, so... But going from movies that are out to movies that are forthcoming, and that involves Avatar, which is a movie that made big waves when it came out, I don't know, 10 years ago? Maybe more? And that is, and it's now, it has getting, like, what, four sequels? Yeah, there's going to be five Avatar movies in total. So rumors titles for all Avatar sequels may provide insight into what James Cameron's upcoming blockbuster movies will be about. So what are the real meanings? It was recently revealed that Avatar 2 and 3 had wrapped production. Now things are starting to get underway on Avatar 4 and Avatar 5. It's been a long and arduous journey getting just one sequel into production, but somewhere along the way, Cameron ultimately decided to tell the story of Pandora and the Navi in a five-part saga. While it's been confirmed that Avatar 2 will take place underwater, though not the, for the entire film, very little, if anything, is known about what the other three Avatar sequels will be about. But thanks to a new report, fans now have at least some idea of what to expect. It appears that Cameron is aiming to explore the foundations of Pandora, specifically the fundamental elements. With each Avatar sequel and the notion it is evident the rumor titles for all four Avatar sequels. So, the second one is called Avatar, The Way of Water. Avatar 2 is bringing back humans in addition to diving deeper into Navi culture, quite literally too. Rather than just directly continuing the story from the first Avatar movie, the sequel will further explore the underwater spaces of Pandora. As such, the amount of time, effort, and money have gone into underwater motion capture. Some of the cast and crew, including Scorny Weaver, have talked about in great lengths. In that regard, it makes sense that the first sequel would be subtitled The Way of Water. The Navi exhibit an intense relationship with the planet of Pandora, which audiences saw quite a bit of in the first Avatar movie. 
and now Avatar 2 will introduce moviegoers to a new part of Pandora. Given the sentience, or supposed sentience, of various parts of the planet, it's possible that Avatar 2 title is hinting at Pandora's ocean having some sort of consciousness. But it's more likely than that the Navi, primarily the Metkina clan, who are the Navi ocean-based clan, believes the oceans have a heart or soul, and it's something they are attached to. Avatar, the way of winter, can have multiple meanings, but putting the spotlight on the Metkina tribe... It's been a long since I've seen Avatar, so I don't remember actually how that's pronounced. Clan makes the most sense, and it'll give audience an idea of what to expect for the long-awaited sequel. Specifically, that it will primarily take place underwater. Avatar 3 is going to be called Avatar the Seed Bearer. In the first movie, the humans, led by Colonel Quartich... Played by Stephen Lang, attacked the Tree of Souls in the third act, which ultimately led to the humans' defeat and banishment from Pandora. But before being exiled, the humans considerably damaged and almost destroyed the tree. While it was still standing towards the end of the movie, that doesn't mean the Navi didn't suffer greatly that day. And so, it would seem that going based on the title of the Seed Bear, Avatar 3 may focus on the Navi rebuilding the Tree of Souls. In the Avatar universe, the Wood Sprite are seeds that come from the Tree of Souls. They float around Pandora and lay wherever they want. The Navi believe purposely laying the wood spread on top of recently deceased Navi will guide their soul into the tree. This is something that, at the very core of their culture, which was threatened by the Quaritch in the first Avatar movie, it's possible that the movie will be spent searching for civic seed wood sprite to rebuild the Tree of Souls. Furthermore, the term bearer would imply that a certain someone would be responsible for carrying the seed, who ends up being remains to be seen, but it would be far fetched to say it wouldn't be far fetched to say that Sam Worthington's Jake Sully could be that person, especially since he's the man the main lead of the franchise, plus there's also the fact that the wood sprites have laid on top of Jake's head in the first Avatar movie when he met Neytiri. Avatar 4 will be the Tolkien Rider. Cameron's first Avatar movie consistently consisted primarily of an aggression between the humans and the Navi, which came to a head in the third act. So the humans are expected to return not only for Avatar 2, but for all four Avatar sequels, with Lang's Quaritch acting as the main villain in each installment, the human versus Navi routine can get old fast. It isn't too original to begin with, so all four Avatar sequels can't focus on the Navi's struggle to survive a potential human invasion and possible occupation. Then Avatar 4 can possibly be the first movie in the franchise to take the story in an entirely new direction by introducing some sort of monster in the mix. Avatar 4's rumored subtitle, The Tolkien Writer, can be attributed to virtually anything since the term Tolkien hasn't been used yet in the Avatar universe. But there are still ways to somewhat determine what Cameron and the rest of the creative team have in mind for Avatar 4. Considering that Cameron tends to borrow heavily from real-life cultures, people, and even stories, it's possible the term Tolkien can refer to Jake Sully or someone else ascending to some form of a high priest or shaman, similar to the Dalai Lama in Tibetan Buddhism. To, uh, Tolkien refers to someone who is reborn and tasked with passing on specific teachings to a new generation. Perhaps an avatar, the Tolkien writer, someone in that regard, an agent being passed down knowledge to the Navi. It would be a great transition into Avatar 5. And Avatar 5 is the quest for uh, uh, Ewa? Ewa? I can't remember. I, like I said, it's been a long time since I was in the first Avatar movie, so I don't remember what how they pronounce certain words. But Tolkien writer does end up referring to someone who is a high priest, even possibly setting up Jake Sully as becoming that person. But it makes sense that Avatar 5 would be about the search for the Pandora goddess uh, Iwa, who is described to Jake in the first Avatar movie as being made up of all living things. Perhaps somewhere along the way, over the course of the first three Avatar sequels, it becomes evident that Iwa is actually real and the main characters must embark on a journey to find her. In that case, the Tolkien writer would be integral in doing just that. Even though audiences were presented with a great deal of information about Pandora in the first Avatar movie, there's still quite a lot that remains unclear, not to mention a plethora of things that haven't yet been revealed. With four Avatar sequels on the way, Cameron and the rest of the creative team can take their time to introduce audiences to every facet of the planet, including the neurological connections to Nav the Navi share with it. If the rumored Avatar titles are real, then it would be interesting to see an Avatar movie that's an adventure in the vein of the Indiana Jones movies, rather than a movie that simply explores more of Pandora and the Navi, though that itself isn't a bad thing. And really, that wraps up what I wanted to talk about today. With the Avatar sequels, with NFL, with Bohemian Rhapsody, with the Spice Girls, with AMC's A-List, that really does it for this week on Poor Entertainment. I want to thank you for listening. You can check out all the other shows on the Journey into Comics Network by going to journeyintocomics.com or checking us out on all the podcasting platforms like 
Apple Podcasts, Spotify, CastBox, Google Play Music, I believe, has it. Uh, also, just check us out at Podbean, who is our podcast host, and we're very thankful that they do that. Or I guess we pay them to do that, so it's more of a... They're providing a service. Also, you can check out Podcastry, which has their own feed, by going to podcastry.com or checking out their live stream on Tuesdays around 5.30 or 6 uh, Eastern Time, which would be... 430 Central. So check them out as well. I believe they're also on Apple Podcasts now, and they also have their own podcast. So you can check that out checking them out on Facebook. I am also on Twitter at Poor Ent. I don't post often. I apologize. It's I'm really bad at social media with the podcast, with all the podcasts I do. And you can check us out early as possible when we record by going to patreon.com slash journey to comics, where there's a ton of tiers that you can get involved with. For as little as $1, you get early access plus exclusive content. So definitely stay up to date with that. And with the cat playing with some stuff, I should probably wrap this up. So thank you for listening. I am Andrew Poor. This is Poor Entertainment. I will see you in two weeks. And you can always tune in next week for Poor News, which is all about political news. And that will be all dealing with the 2018 November elections. So make sure to go out and vote tomorrow if you want to. If you don't want to, that's on you. The only thing is, if you don't vote... You can't complain about the results. That is Porn Entertainment for this week. Have a great week.